All right, guys, we are live. Um, I believe it's working. I hope it's working. I just got to figure out where my comments are because I'm not seeing my comments. There they are. Okay. Anyway, I guess you guys had your own chat going without me here, which is nice. I was a little bit late. I had to feed all the dogs. You guys interrupted my workout, um, which is absolutely okay. I got up a little bit uh, later than I should have and didn't get my whole workout in. So, Anyway, uh, let's see. We got a bunch of people in here already. We got uh, how many people we got in here? Can't even see it. I, I'm using this software, which I really, really love, but I'm still really, really learning how to use it. So, um, let me see here. I can see. Oh, it says no eyeballs. It says no viewers. Why would it say no viewers? That makes no sense. Um, oh, four viewers. Okay. Anyway, I can see there's a lot of viewers on here because um, see all your comments. Um, and thank you for all the compliments. I'm just looking through them. So today we've got a special show. Uh, I used to always do my, um, so you got a Malinois. I used to always do it in just a regular sit down podcast Q and A kind of thing where it was uh, me reading off questions, me kind of looking at the, uh, at the screen, not really talking to anybody, but just basically sitting down and doing a, a, a podcast kind of uh, by myself, which was, it was where it worked. It was nice, but I wanted to change it up a little bit and um and make it live because people have complained that i haven't done this so you got a malware in a long time so now um here and there i'll do it live for the youtube audience i think it's a, it's a really great concept i think it's a really great um topic i think it's so important um thank you riley 60 people okay good i i you know i don't know why okay now i see 110 117 talking about um Malinois, you know, Malinois, first of all, I'm going to say something that people are going to either really, really like to hear or really, really not like to hear. And that is, I've never said that not, you know, that, that people shouldn't get a Malinois. What I say is that people should be aware what they're getting when they get a Malinois. And when I say a Malinois, I mean, we're talking about Dutch Shepherds, we're talking about working line German Shepherds, we're talking about um, Rottweilers, Dobermans, uh, Dutchies, any of these breeds that are working line dogs. I, I didn't think So You Got a Working Line Dog sounded as good as So You Got a Malinois. So I titled the show So You Got a Malinois that I thought was a little bit more catchy. It was a catchy thing. I was trying to be catchy. So, um, okay, yeah, we don't need to keep track of the count um, because you guys are going to see a little less than I see because I see 137. I'm seeing it in a different stream. But um, it doesn't matter. Goofy's right here. He's at my feet. He was outside working out with me. He just had breakfast. Um, everybody just had breakfast except for me. I've got a, a, a protein bar that I'm going to eat somewhere during the show because I'm famished. I'm starving. Um, but uh, th thank you guys from all over the world, you know, from uh, Philippines, New York, South Africa, um, you know, all over the United States. And um, t t what I'm trying to do on these shows as well is stay really on a topic, which I think makes the show a little bit more viable for when people want to later go back and look at something. You know, every once in a while, I'll do the, the Q&A, the live Q&A, where I just talk about every single topic under the sun. But today, I want to talk about um, just, just Malinois. And those of you who are asking, where's Janet? Janet is heading out to play golf, so she's not here. And that leaves me by myself, and uh, it, uh, it, it makes it a little bit harder to do the show because what I need to do is I need to look at your questions, which are down here on this screen. My video is on this screen over here, so I've got a bunch of different things. If I could, at some point, I'll have the camera set up so I can actually show you what, um, what I see. I'll show you the behind the scenes in the studio. But yeah, so Eric, you're saying mouths are not for everybody, should be screened for reputable owners. You know, ideally, I would love all dogs screened for reputable owners. And, you know, it's, it's something that comes to mind is, you know, there's always people like somewhere, you know, here in Malibu, um, or not here in Malibu, over in Malibu, I'm actually not in Malibu right now, there was, um, okay, somebody from Uganda. I have visited Uganda, and I think it's a fantastic, fantastic country, and I hope to go back there again. Um, there was a, a story in uh, Malibu of somebody kicking a dog, homeless guy kicking a dog. And right away, people were up in arms saying, oh my God, we, we should take this dog away. We should take the dog away from blah, blah, blah. You know, when we resort to this kind of a police state where, you know, we have all these rules and regulations, um, I think it's not a good place to live, right? I don't, I don't agree with that whole, whole over dictatorship of laws. Um, 
I think people need to be responsible. They need to really understand what they're getting as far as a dog, and they need to understand how to handle that dog. But um, I have a really hard time when people start saying, take the person's dog away. And I'll tell you why I have a hard time with it, and then we'll get into this so you got a Malinois law thing. Um, if you have a society where you're taking away dogs based on what somebody says, then you're going to be living in, in a really Nazi type world. And that is where I report you, you know, I'm your neighbor. I report you. Oh, I saw him doing this. And then the police comes over and they take your dog. There's a homeless woman living here, not too far from, from where we live here. And she has her dog in a crate in the car. And all these people are on next door flip the, flipped out, right? Just flipped out. Like they're, they're psychotically flipped out saying we should take these take this dog away from this woman. Well, I'm going to tell you something. First of all, if she fell on hard times and all she has left is her dog and you're going to take her dog because she's got the dog in a crate and keeps the dog in a crate for several hours at a time, first of all, she's more responsible than a lot of these morons living in these houses, these really expensive houses in that neighborhood, telling people that they should take this dog away because she's trying to take care of the dog. She's trying to keep it in the crate so nothing happens to it. And it just irks me. It just pisses me off to the nth degree to know that people are going to start, you know, reporting people and doing this and doing that. I hate that. I just really, really, really hate that. Because there are always the little tattletales, always the little quarterback, the, the, the armchair quarterbacks who are saying these things and who really have no function in the world. So very, very, very annoying to me. Um, okay, so we want to talk about Malinois. So Malinois or any, and, and I'm going to open the question up to any working line dogs, um, are a different breed in that they require a lot of extra work. They require more. Um, they require more training, more stimulation, more control, more hands-on uh, training, and such. And when people don't understand that, right, they um, they fail the dog. So a Malinois is a super fun dog for you to get because it. It, it'll just do, it'll keep going and going and going. Dwayne is real similar, right? So Jan, Janet is seeing this with Dwayne. He will train and train and train and train and train, and he just won't stop. That's really fun if you want to train. But if you're in a situation where you have to go to work for eight hours, you have to drive an hour back and forth, if you have kids that you're trying to raise, if you have things around the house you're trying to do, and, and all these things, you have a small house with a small yard, and you can't get this dog out to exercise, to stimulate him, to, to um, train him, and all these things, you end up with a dog that will become very, very, very destructive. And not only destructive to its own environment, the house, the crate, the yard, or anything like that, but it'll become destructive to itself and other people. So in other words, the dog might start self-mutilating. The dog might start, um, oh, there's Janet leaving. Bye, honey. See, she says bye. And Riley said bye. See, I, I'm, now, now I'm very glad I looked down because of all the times to look down, that was the best time to look down. Um, and she says bye, and I'm going to wish her a really nice golf game because she just took a golf lesson yesterday. And... Uh, and Janet's a beautiful golfer, by the way. She's an amazing golfer. So, and I love playing golf, too, but we're totally off topic. Um, but, but that's a really important component. So, you know, when you have hobbies like this, like golf, you're going to go out and play golf for two, three, four hours. What are you going to do with your dog? Now, Janet has me. And I'll, I stay home with the dogs. I'm a, I'm a stay-at-home dad. And I just, I, I babysit the dogs, right? That's what I do. I stay home and I babysit the dogs and, and I love doing it. But you have to consider these things before you get the dog. So your average Labrador, you know, poodle, you know, average German Shepherd, anything like that, it's not as complicated to own them because they're lower in drive. And that lower drive allows them to just kind of adapt, They'll just kind of lay down. They'll check out. Jimmy's a great example of that. Jimmy's a perfect example of that. Now, Dwayne is high drive. Maya's high drive. And, and, uh, and Goofy's high drive. Goofy's older now. And again, so is um, Maya. They're both kind of getting up there in age. And Jimmy is older. But Jimmy was always a super chill, super calm dog. But... Um, yeah, and there's a great dual spectrum you're talking about where, you know, you see the idea of a Doberman being one level, but the, um, the, uh, the Malinois being a different level. And again, it's not the breed. I mean, Malinois as a breed is generally a much more 
um, higher drive animal than say a Yorkie, a Yorkshire Terrier or something like that. But the breeding of certain lines of those dogs. For example, German Shepherds have so many various lines. You have your show lines, your working lines, your German, you know, German working lines. But when you get into those higher drive working line dogs, they're much, much harder to maintain. Also, they're more dominant. They form bad habits really easily that if you don't catch them early on, if you don't see what's going on with these dogs early, early on, you're going to have a problem. And that's what I want you to know. In other words, it's a great, great um, thing to have a dog that loves to train. So, you know, and, and you've got to be committed to that too, by the way. So in other words, you might say to yourself, oh yeah, I watched all of Robert's videos. I, I, I love training dogs. This is going to be super fun. And you make this decision, you get yourself a Malinois. And then next thing you know, you know, three years down the line, you meet the girl of your dreams, the guy of your dreams, you know, you, you, you decide you want to do something else. You want to take up uh, photography. And now your dog is still there, right? In other words, the dog doesn't go away. And, and these dogs require that for a long, long time. And that's critical, right? When they're in that place, they require that. When they're that drive, when they're that temperament, that personality, they're not going to just stop when you decide, well, you know, I don't want to train anymore. It's not like a race car that you could take it out and race it and then say, you know what, I don't want to race cars anymore. And then boom, put the car in the garage and you're fine. There's, there's Goofy. For those of you who wanted to see my dogs, there's Goofy right back there. Um, okay, and then there's a great question, Jeff. And I'm going to kind of here and there just pop down and look at questions. And if I don't see you ask the question, I may not answer it. I'm by myself. Janet's out. Janet's driving over golf. But I'm... Um, I, I look down, if I see a question, I'll answer it, and that's the best I can do. And what I'll try to do is add it to the broadcast if I can, so like here. So Jeff says, what do you think about having more than one dog to help bleed off some of the energy and working the line like a Border Collie? So the problem with that concept is that you're not going to bleed off energy, you're just going to fester more. You're going to develop more and more and more energy, and then that becomes a problem. Right. And because now you have two dogs running well. So instead of, you know, 100 pounds or 80 pounds of energy, now you're going to have 160 pounds of energy manifesting its way around your house. That's really, really, really critical to understand. Do me a favor. Also, I, I love all you guys commenting and saying hi and doing all these things. If you have a question, if your if your comment is a question, please put a question mark right at the beginning so that I don't read all the way through it, right? Because I'm gonna and, and keep them short because I've got to read it and answer it. So that's really really important. Okay, this looks like a question here, so I'm gonna add this to the broadcast. And it's from Islam. My man was so smart, but he only obey commands when he want. I know we understand what I'm saying, but he just chooses when he want to obey and whatnot, what shall I do? So this is a great example of a dominant dog, a, a dog with a more dominant personality where you're not able to show him that you're in control. Now that control doesn't come um, by being a bully. It comes by being a fair leader. And, and, and being a fair leader means that you're going to show a dog what you want him to do. You are going to help him do it, to learn it, you are going to reward him for doing it, and you're going to correct him if he's incorrect. Now, I forgot what those four were. I just said they just came off the top of my head. Somebody should write those down because I think those are very, very important points. Right? You must be fair. That, and, your, and your dog is not seeing that Islam. He's not seeing that. You need to kind of make sure he does see that. Okay, here's a question for a vegan power couple. Tips for managing a three, oh my God, a three Malinois household. That's... That's insane. That's like that's a that's a lot, a lot, a lot of dogs. I mean, you have a lot of energy. You have a lot. I mean, it's I don't know. I mean, I couldn't even. I if you are very, very experienced. In other words, if you're asking the question, I and, and please don't take this as an insult. But if you're asking the question, you, you're probably over your head because anybody I know, like my friend Danny, has has several three, four, five Malinois, and he can handle it. It's um, it's you get your hands full. There's no real. There's no, I could spend two hours talking about this, but it would take a lot more than that to get that question answered. Um, okay, what's this one? Curry says, do you think a novice can own a high drive dog? Yes, I do. I think you can. I don't think it will be, I don't think it'll be fun. I don't think it'll be exciting. I think you'll have a lot of problems with it. 
Um, but yeah, you can. I would definitely recommend getting a lower drive dog to start with to get your feet wet. You know, that would be my question to you. Um, Giuliano says um, West German show line. No, West German show lines are not that high of a drive dog. They're just they're they're better for a novice owner or something like that because they'll be a lot easier for you. Um, so uh, remember I asked if you could just put a question mark before your sentence, not after it, before it, because when I read, I see the first part first. So please, if you have a question, start it with a question mark or else I can't take the question. Um, reasonable time for my mouth to be in a dog crate, a couple hours, three, four hours at a time, but the dog needs a lot more time out of the crate. So Cass, this is the way the question should look. See, it's a question mark first, so I know it's a question. My mouth's Grand studs are active duty canine units in Houston, Texas. Likes to grab and tug on my great Pyrenees till she growls no matter how much I correct. How to make her stop. She's extremely persistent. So there you've got a dog now. Okay, now that's Dwayne in the background you're seeing over there. That's Dwayne a meter. Um, you've got a dog that is a lot of drive, right? And, and Malinois are notoriously not good with other dogs because they are such high drive. that they, Not that they're not good. I'm going to rephrase that. First of all, they're high drive so that it triggers a lot of dogs. Either if it's a very small dog, a lot of Malinois don't like that. They'll go after them because it triggers their prey drive because they're usually not conditioned. Now, Goofy, I conditioned from early, early on with, um, with small dogs. So he kind of got that with my bird and all that. But... Um, you you need to uh, you need to be completely in control of this dog, or else you're you're just not 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 gonna have fun. Um, I'm trying to read what this says here. Well, anyway, let's keep going here. All right, Bobby Brown, what to expect the first 24 hours in a eight week old puppy? And I'm, again, I'm just talking about Malinois, so I don't know. Um, and I'm gonna say for the first uh, 24 hours of an eight week old puppy is 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 complete screaming and, 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 you know, insanity. That's, that's what you're going to expect. Um, let's see. Here we go. My German Shepherd jumps on anyone he sees. Can you help me? I've addressed this question 3,000 times. So um, you need to train your dog. You need to not, you need to control the dog from not doing these bad behaviors, right? You need to control the dog to not jump. So that means, in other words, if the dog is off leash and gets to run up and jump on people, then the dog is going to do exactly that. And that's where you're running into your problems. You're letting the dog do a behavior that you don't want the dog to do. So then you end up trying to correct the behavior. It's always better to prevent a behavior than to correct the behavior, because when you correct it, the dog has already done it. And then the corrections oftentimes seem like an engagement, which you don't really want. Um, Melissa, do I correct my five-month-old Mal when she's overexcited playing with other dogs she knows or let them play it out themselves? My sister's two-year-old lab lets her get away with it. Well, I mean, a two-year-old lab and a Malinois are two different animals, right? So you need to control your Malinois. I always, always, always try to control prey drive, and um, I would really suggest that you do too. Um, Okay, I'm going to answer this because it kind of relates. It's a high-drive dog. Would training high-drive field retrievers prepare you for training a high-drive Malinois? And I would say yes. Yeah, I would say any dog that is a high-drive dog, such as I mean, field retrievers are very, very high-drive dogs, it gives you that um, same idea of a, of a high-drive dog, a dog that requires more attention, more, more focus, more training, more, uh, more energy dissipation. You need to figure out how to work the dog, how to handle the dog, because it's that high drive that makes it so complicated, right? That's the one, that, the one thing that people seem to miss. Um, okay. Hoku says, what's the best training technique to use to correct the drive to nip lightly bite the back legs of other dogs, maybe do it being hurt. Well, it is that that is exactly what does it. And you're going to need to make sure to teach the dog control first. So Malinois and any high drive dog that any dog that has a drive issue needs to be taught to channel that drive. In other words, instead of running, chasing, jumping on things, you learn to lie down, come back to me, play with a ball, go lie down and take that drive and channel it to somewhere else. It's really important to understand that 
crushing these drives, which I, I see people do online. I see a lot of trainers, you know, start zapping dogs for, 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 for having more drive than they should have. And that only makes that frustration worse, right? A dog's drive, I mean, you can kind of compare it. It's not the same, but I'm going to just compare it to somebody who's really, really anxious. And if they're anxious and you keep slapping them and slapping them, it doesn't make the anxiety go away. It, in fact, it heightens that anxiety. So um, channeling those drives is really going to be important. So if the dog is nipping at the back of other dog's legs, lie down, good dog lies down, the dog comes back to you, the dog can play tug with you, the dog can play ball with you, the dog can do something with you, the dog can do healing, the dog can um, stand, shake paw, do whatever. You can give the dog a job to do that doesn't relate to chasing the other dog. That's really, really, really important. Okay, so... This is a really interesting question. Tips to train a two-month-old Malinois female who's not food or toy motivated. If you have a two-year-old Malinois that's not food or toy motivated, there's something wrong. It's not a Malinois because I've never in my life seen one that isn't, right? In other words, th there's no dog really that's not food motivated because all dogs need to eat. The mistake a lot of you guys make um, is you feed the dog and then you expect the dog to work for food, and it's not gonna happen. You, you, most people are afraid to give the dog what they need, which is structure, which is a job to do. In other words, your dog does not eat until he's performed a task, until he's listened to you, until he sits or downs or comes or stands or, or does a retrieve or, or, or waits while another dog eats. A, jo a dog must have a job to do. And if your dog is not food motivated, then you need to not feed that dog for one meal and start hand feeding that dog and then put luring and shaping into that dog's repertoire, right? In other words, that dog must do something for food. And I mean, with Jimmy, Janet had Jimmy, and she did the exact same thing. She used food, food only. He earned every bit of his food, and he's an amazing dog. Now, the stuff Jimmy can do is really, really amazing. Um, okay, what's this? Uh, okay, another stay-at-home dad. I mean, I'm kidding about that, because I actually do work a lot, but my studio and my training is in my home. Um, you need to find a way to take care of separation anxiety with my shepherd, nervous to leave her at home, and small steps. Well, small steps to take is to start leaving the dog, right? And this is, I think, a big problem that we all, you know, fell into. I mean, we didn't, I didn't fall into it, but people fell into because with the stay at home, oh my God, it was the best thing for the dogs. The pandemic, I mean, the dogs must have caused the pandemic because they were so happy that everybody's staying at home with them. The issue with that is you're forming habits with a dog that are not maintainable. Right? That's what people do. They get a dog and then they train the dog every day because they got, took two weeks off and every day the dog is doing something and every day and every day because it's a puppy and they love it and it's new and it's this and it's that. But the problem is um, you, you, you're not going to maintain that. So at some point it's going to fall apart for the dog and the dog is going to get sad, the dog is going to be miserable and you're going to fail the dog. Give the dog in the beginning what you can give the dog the whole, the whole life. So with you, since you did fall into this mistake, you need to start unwinding what you've created. And, and I would just start, you know, leaving the house for a little bit of a time, you know, here and there and just keep going. I'm kind of probably really late on these. Um, okay, here's one. Toby, we have a gorgeous five-month-old Mal who is going through this, his teething. He is now pushing his large molars Poor lad, any tips? Yeah, a couple of things you can do with the dog. You can give him something to chew on. Like a lot of the old German technique used to be to get like white washcloths, soak them, get them wet, wring them out a little bit, and then put them in the freezer. And then when they're frozen, let the dog chew on them. That's a really, really, really good thing to do. Um, that, that would be the number one thing I would do. Frozen bananas are great. Any kind of things that's, that's cool on the gums will help your dog a lot. So, um, okay. Mr. Singh, how to train a Dutch shepherd at around five months old and he is teething. He's dropping his milk teeth. Okay, so that's a good qu question. How about the same one I just gave? Something to chew on. Um, Beth says, would you please describe differences similarities between the four types of Belgians in your experience? Um, think of getting another Agronadale. <sighs> yeah, it's hard to um, categorize. Now, the Malinois is definitely going to be the, uh, the the hardest, highest 
uh, temperament, the highest drive of all of them. Uh, the, 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 the other ones, the Lacamoires are, have just been recognized. They're the, 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 the fuzzy ones. I think they're really cute, but there's been a lot of aggression in those lines. Um, the Turves are nice. They're, I think the Turve would be the b most balanced of it if you get it from a good breeder. But if you don't, they can be really, really nervy. Um, and I don't know that much about the Granadales personally, so I, I really can't, don't feel comfortable answering that. Um, Amber says I do IGP with my 10 month old which is used to be IPO and before that it was Schutz and there's all these name changes which I just found kind of crazy but anyway um, love this board when he's an adult I'd like to get a second dog more drive how do I deal with different dog in the same pack very easy because you're going to have structure on your dog and uh, you're going to get a dog of the opposite sex so if you have a, um, a female now that way you have a male now sorry um, then you're going to get a female and, and you're going to balance it out you're going to have good structure you're going to wait till the dog is at least 18 months to two and a half years old or, or older and then you'll bring another dog in you'll put the new dog in a crate and it's going to work out just fine um, Okay, so Ari Malm says, when a working dog shows fear, avoidance, biting, would it be, can it be genetic or can it be experienced? Well, it can be both, right? And if you know the dog's history, then you'll know if it's genetic or if it's something that the dog experienced. It's always easier if it's something the dog experienced to kind of undo than if it's genetic. If it's genetic, it's really hard to un unwind that. That's, that's a really, really hard thing to do. Um, okay, this will be a funny one. Malinois and cats. If I get a young puppy, will he eventually see cats as housemates and not prey? Would he eventually be able to let, to be left free in the home alone with cats? Well, that depends on two things. One is the genetic drive of that dog. Like some dogs genetically are just wired to kill cats, right? They're just super high drive and you're never going to fix it. There are those dogs. If you get a dog at a young age and it's a more of a balanced line, it's more of a, an easier temperament, a nicely well-bred dog, and I would really talk to the breeder because your breeder should know the lines of these dogs. If the parents had this crazy uh, desire to kill and chase cats, um, they'll also see if those drives are present in a young puppy. A good breeder is worth their weight in gold. Um, and ask them. But if you get a dog that comes from good lines and the breeder can tell you that, yeah, the dog is, has some good lines and would be okay, then I wouldn't just willy-nilly let him in. But what I would do is let the dog um, be in a crate, see the cats, see the movement, see the excitement in a calm, calm place for a long time before I left them out. Okay, Melissa says, do I correct my five month? Whenever you say, do I correct, the answer is always yes, right? You're always gonna correct your dog. Um, because people are so afraid of the word correction. They automatically think, well, I don't want my dog not to be my friend. And it's the same thing that's going on parenting now, right? Everybody says, well, I, should I correct my child? Well, yes, you should, right? Should you correct any creature? Yes, because if you don't correct the wrong, then you're allowing the wrong to continue. You, you must understand that corrections are the most important thing you do in life. If you're making a mistake, if you're about to eat poison food, should I correct you? Yes, right? You, you, you must understand that corrections are a necessary part of life. So should you correct your five on the mound when she's overexcited playing with other dogs? She knows, or let them play up themselves. And by the way, you already asked me that question, Melissa, or somebody else did in the exact same sentence as that. Yes, you must, must, must correct them. Um, Alyssa says, how do you handle exciting anxiety, vocalization on a high drive dog. I put my mouth on a stay. He can do it, but he's constantly whining. Well, you need to move the dog during excitement and then get them to get short durations of the behavior you're looking for in order for it to become much calmer, right? You need to get the dog. You can't just, if he's whining and going crazy and ask him to stay, it's going to just, he's going to explode. But you need to kind of move him, get a short one and show him what you want. Um, I used to feed my mouth only raw meat like beef, pork, and chicken. Will there be a problem? Well, you can't just feed them just meat, right? I mean, just, just that. Because what happens, right, even though an animal like a dog will eat raw meat, they also get other nutrients out of it. They'll eat organ meat. They'll eat, you know, uh, the contents of the stomach. They'll, they'll get a lot of other nutrients. And even if they don't, they need them. So a balanced diet is really, really important. I mean, you guys know I've been using the Visionary Pet Food. If you go to my site, robertcabral.com, you can get a discount code on that. Um, 
and I do get a commission on it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not here just hustling things to sell them. I only sell products I really believe in. Um, I was just down at the Visionary Pet Offices yesterday getting two more bags of food. So I feed it. I like it. I think it's a good food. Um, you need a balanced diet. But, but the number one, the best thing you're going to feed your dog, and I'll tell you this, and I talked about this with the owner of the, the company, he even said the best thing you're going to feed your dog is a, is a raw diet, is raw meats, vegetables, fish oils, you know, fish, um, like chia seeds, hemp seeds mixed together, and supplements. Now, if you can't do that, the next best thing is going to be a, a frozen, raw, prepared diet. Then it's going to be a freeze-dried diet. Then it's going to go down to kibble. Kibble's the last on the list, but then there's different stages of kibble, so you'll need to know that. Um, and thank you guys for listening. See, now it's nice. I can look down. Oh, that's a question. But here, Riley just made a comment. So Riley can make comments, and that's really cool, and everybody can. But um, when I see a question, then I... I, I, I answer that. Rohan says, can we sometimes see how does your average day go? You know, people always want to see that. And it's really, really hard for me because um, my day is kind of boring, right? I'm in front of the computer handling things. I go out and train the dog for a few minutes here and there. And, um, and then I just, you know, it's, it's, I'm kind of private like that. So I probably won't do it. Um, best mal breeders, and that's really, really, really going to depend on what you're looking for in um, in a mal. Are you looking for a protection? Are you looking for a herding dog? Are you looking for a dog for agility? A, a show line dog? There's way too many um, lines. I mean, I, obviously, my breeders I consider the best, but um, I would really look. I would I would join some of the Malinois groups on Facebook, I would look to see if you can get in and then really make a decision what you're looking for in a Malinois before you look for the best Mal breeders. Um, if you join an IPO club, you probably find out that they'll have certain breeders that they like better, but um, it's a different, different thing. So again, okay. Alexandria Clinton, what do you think of German Shepherd Mal crosses? Um, you know, I'll tell you what I don't like um, is I don't like anybody crossing dogs because now some of them are great, right? I know some people have done it for some police work and they're more controllable and they're fine. But what always ends up happening when you mix it, you don't know enough about the genetics that you're dealing with. And you're going to somehow, somewhere end up with a dog that you know, a bunch of dogs are going to end up in a shelter and end up being killed because people start breeding for something. In other words, uh, another great example is in agility, people have bred like all these crosses because they want to do agility. So I want to do agility. I want to, I want this certain drive. Okay, I'm going to mix a Staffordshire and a, and a Border Collie, which is a wacky mix, right? But I've seen these dogs. Then that's great. I, I'm going to take the best one. But then there's eight other ones. And I don't know eight people who want that same kind of crazy drive and mix. And a lot of them are going to have genetic issues. A lot of them are going to have behavioral issues. So I don't, ideally I like the cross, but I don't think it's... Um, it's, it's, it's a good idea. Okay, wow, thank you, Yoon, for a super chat. That's pr pretty, that's a very generous super chat. That might be the biggest one we've ever gotten. Um, okay, your question is, I have to answer it. It pops up here on a big, bold screen for me. Um, so a four-month-old female mountain, she only lunges and barks at people and dogs when she walks with me. When she is handled by a stranger, a trainer she met for the first time, she doesn't do any of it. I think she's trying to protect me. How can I redirect her? Okay, that's a good question. And the reason your dog is doing that is because your dog is trying to protect you. In other words, you haven't given the dog the structure that your dog needs. And the trainer is able to be more um, uh, neutral with the dog. The dog, the, the trainer is not as attached to the dog, so the dog is, is more on, on its toes. It, it's normal, right? It's normal for a dog to act differently with a stranger because it's what's called a newness factor. In other words, the dog is trying to figure out the, the stranger. Now, eventually, he might end up becoming just as boisterous with the, stranger, with the uh, trainer but more than likely, if it's a good trainer, it won't because the trainer will know how to watch those pockets. And what you can do, June, is you can look at these behaviors that the trainer is doing. He's not emotional. He's not coddling the dog. The dog is not on a tight leash. There will be certain behaviors that you can learn from this trainer that will get you to be a better handler. And you've really got to embrace it because if the dog is only four months old, you've got the world ahead of you and you can fix all these issues. What I would really do is focus on not that the dog is trying to protect you, but you're miscommunicating with the dog on how to handle the pressure. 
more than likely, I would guarantee it, ask your trainer and come to the next live chat and let me know, um, you're, you have the dog on a tight leash and the dog is, is, is it's a, cause at four months old, it's more than likely a genetic thing, which is fight and flight. The dog doesn't know it can get away. Work on loose leash walking, work on engagement back to you, work on playing games with the dog. When the dog gets excited, turn the dog back to you. Dog tugs with you, plays with you, or gets treats from you. And I think that will fix the problem. Um, remember here, I'm looking for question marks. Okay, here. Now, this might not even be about a Malinois, but um, it's got a question mark in front of it. If the question's not in that format, then I can't answer it. Um, you mentioned Dwayne is quite high drive like Goofy. Is this usual for labs? It's usual for labs who are uh, sporting labs. Like, like he's a British line dog. So he's, his job is to go hunting and his job is to run to 300 yards um, to go retrieve a duck. So he needs an intense amount of drive. So yes, it is very, very normal. Um, Milena, I almost didn't see those red question marks. I don't know he did that, but it's very hard for me to see him. Um, <clears throat> should I teach my dog, my mouth, to not to bark at the doorbell, or can I let... I, you know, I always prefer a dog to be quiet. And people say, well, you know, I live alone. I want my dog to be alerting and this and that. And that's all fine. Your dog will protect you. But the dog's level of excitement, every time the doorbell rings, gets crazier and crazier and crazier, and you're just going to have too much to, to deal with. Christian says, any tips to build drive on a dog? I have a German Shepherd has low drive to work. He has detected, he has detected work, but has low drive. I don't understand what that means, detected work. But um, building drive is done, you know, when the dog is hungry, you're giving the dog something to work for, such as treats or toys or something like that. It's also done by putting a dog on a harness and teasing the dog with a toy, teasing him, teasing him, teasing him, because you need to build frustration. Frustration builds drive, and that's how I would probably do it. Um, what if you want a high drive dog to do a dog sports and you are a novice owner? Okay, that's a great question. So then what I would do is I would make sure, first of all, you need to make sure you're going to be committed to those dog sports for a good duration of time, right? In other words, it's going to take you a couple of years to be good at it. And then you're going to compete for a couple of years. So can you dedicate four or five years of your life to that? And ask yourself this question. Have you been dedicated to working out, to learning an instrument, learning a language, doing something? Do you have the, the, the ability to see things through? Or do you like things for six months and then fade on and off? And ask yourself that question honestly. If you are a person who kind of flip-flops in and out of things, it, it's probably not for you, right? Um, that's all I can say. I and mean, you've got to be really honest with yourself. But it's a great question. I mean, thank you for that. Um, what to do if a dog is in food motive? All dogs are food motivated, right? And I'll tell you, if you're doing it raw feeding, get yourself some freeze-dried food, right? Because you can get that. Visionary has it. Stella and Chewy's has it. They all have the little freeze-dried, which is a very limited ingredient um, food. Or you can just maybe cut yourself some small pieces of meatballs, you know, or roll yourself a small piece of meatballs, cut yourself a small piece of steak, put it in a dehydrator, you'll have something, and use that. Okay, I'm going to read this because that's interesting. love how you don't pay attention to modern science. Um, by the way, dog training is an art form. It's something that we make ourselves. When people get into the whole science bullshit, they always will say, well, you don't correct dogs. Science is proven. Science is proven. Dogs are not test tubes. So these kind of comments here piss me off, okay? And I'm going to give you a minute of my mind here, Avery. Let me tell you about my science. My science is thousands of dogs over 12 years that have, and 12 plus years that have been in shelters that have um, been ready to be killed because science didn't work because no scientist like you, Avery, didn't come in here and into the shelter and work with these dogs. Science didn't help save their lives. Science is what gave up on them and said, well, the dog is too aggressive. Let's put the dog in a shelter. Let me tell you more about my science, okay? My scientists have competed in competitive dog sports, protection sports, obedience sports, from IPO to Mondial Ring to Schutzen to family pet dogs to shelter dogs. Find me one of your scientists who has this kind of a background, and then you can say goodbye, because this kind of bullshit I don't need in, in the chats. Right? It's, 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 it's just really, really ridiculous when you, when you come up with these kind of crazy cockamamie ideas. Okay, I'm getting a lot of questions. Um, I think they might be popping up. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom here. So if I missed your question, um, yeah, it will be a Robert rant. <coughs> um, I, I'm, I won't announce my breeders in a public forum like this because it's going to put them under too much pressure. Um, 
so if you're interested in a breeder, research it. You, you can look through my stuff and you can find out who, um, who I like. Okay, Brooklyn James, what a good name that is. Do we seek out a, a breed-specific trainer? How do we choose one? The, excellent question, James. Excellent question. Um, what you want to do is you want to seek out a behavior-specific trainer, right? A behavior-specific trainer is going to be much, much more beneficial than a breed-specific trainer. There's no real breed-specific trainers. I mean, if you find one, it's, you know, it's it's... It's really crazy because people always say, have you ever trade, trained a, a schnauzer? Yeah, I have. But that doesn't make me a good schnauzer trainer. It's understanding the behavior that your dog is going through. That makes me a good uh, trainer. In other words, if you're looking for a teacher, you don't want a teacher that just teaches, you know, Irish people. You want a teacher who teaches social studies or, you know, history or whatever. Be specific in what you're trying to learn. It's a good, good, good question. I understand where you're coming from. Look for the behavior you want to deal with or what you want to train the dog to. In other words, you want to train your dog to do competitive obedience. Find a trainer that understands competitive obedience. If you're looking for solving behavioral problems, find somebody who will solve behavioral problems and you'll do much, much, much better. Um, well, you know, the reason that uh, here... Silver. The reason that this person got a tongue lashing is because they said something obnoxious, right? Um, like how you don't pay attention to science. It's a ridiculous comment. It's, it's, these are positive-only trainers who always are going to come in. They're armchair quarterbacks. They sit behind. all the, their, their muscles are these muscles, right? They can type things and be, oh, da, 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 and then they'll send you a little link to some bullshit article that's 16 pages long that doesn't really prove anything. You pay your dues. You pay your dues by doing what you do, right? You want to see a good fighter? Look at a UFC fighter. You don't say, oh, well, you're ignoring the history of boxing because you're not doing this. Because it's bullshit. The guy's kicking somebody else's ass because he's better, right? He's found the solution. And it's not a time thing. There's people, for example, in the MMA, who get in and they're doing it less time and they're better than somebody else. There's dog trainers. My friend Oscar is a fantastic IPO trainer. He's a young guy. There's people in their 50s and 60s who've done it for 40 years who suck. It's not about this. It's you're either good or you're not good. You get it or you don't get it, right? It's not about understanding the uh, scientific aspects of notes when you play a guitar. If you're an incredible guitarist, you might have just picked up the guitar and just learned it. So that's what really frustrates me about all of this is that people don't get it. Um, okay, I, I'm, again, I'm looking for question marks. Okay, here. Dinesh. See, there's a question mark underneath there. That's that's what I'm looking for. There's a question mark, right? There. Hey, Robert, my eight-month-old Malma just runs out of the door whenever he sees the chance. Probably has, oh, probably has to pee. He doesn't want to come back inside and goes off wandering. What can I do about this? I can tell you what you can do. I did a video on this about door dashing. I would watch that video. Um, I would put the dog um, in to a obedience position, right? I would put, have a line on the dog and I would set him up a hundred times in front of the do door and I would correct him. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna put this, because uh, here's something interesting, Casey, and I don't know if you really are a biologist, but I'm saying, here, I'm a biologist who studied animal behavior and I think your method of training is natural for a dog. Thank you, right? Because you don't need to get over scientific about stuff. It's black and white. It's right and wrong. I taught karate for 20 years. I taught children. I didn't go to school to learn how to teach children karate. I learned karate. I knew karate. And I partitioned, I gave, I, I, I gave my knowledge to these children and to these adults. And I ta taught many, many people. I taught hand-to-hand -hand combat to police officers and, and, and military people because I knew how to do it and I knew how to teach it. Dog training is not that different, right? It's not, not complicated. It's so simple. The, the, the idiots who make it scientific, and I'm saying this, I'm really being serious about this. If you're going to make it scientific, you're making it more complicated than it is, right? It just needs to be taught. A dog needs to know black and white, right from wrong, good from bad. That's it. You lure and shape the behaviors, you correct for bad behaviors, you reward for good behaviors. I'm still mesmerized that I have a career and I still am able to get people to uh, join up and, 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 and take my lessons because 
It's so simple. And I appreciate you doing it, right? I appreciate it, but I, I try to make it as simple as you possibly can get it. Thank you, Casey, by the way, for the comment. It means a lot to me. Um, okay, please, okay. What is sundowning? It's like when this, are you talking about the behavior the dog exhibits when the sun goes on? Let me know what you mean by that, because I don't, I don't, I'm sundowning. Um, just ask the question again, but just be specific with these. Okay, here, Chris Penfield. I have a seven month old female male with a five year old low drive male American show line German Shepherd neutered. Um, what sign changes should I look out for or worry about when her first heat arrives? Well, if he's neutered, it's not going to be as significant because he doesn't have the testosterone, which would give him the drive to do that. Um, but you'll see a lot of like um, on it. On it depends when he was neutered. Also, um, you'll notice a lot of um, lick, lipping, licking, L-I-C-K-I-N-G, licking, um, quivering of the lips, um, a lot of real, a lot of interest in her hind quarters. Um, that's what you really, really, really want to look for. Um, okay, there is a positive only trainer I have to work with to adopt my dog. How can I present the balance method to them so they can understand that I'm not going to abuse my dog? And you can't. There's no, no such thing as a positive only trainer who understands balance training or else they would be a balanced trainer, right? That's it. That's it. A positive only trainer will never, never be able to understand the need for a correction or they would be a balanced trainer. In other words, balanced trainers are positive trainers. I'm a positive trainer. I use treats. I use reinforcement. I use praise. I, you know, I lure and shape. That's positive training. That's critical, critical to understand that that is positive training. The idea that I will never correct a dog when they do something wrong, I will never tell this dog no, I will never yank on a leash, that is a positive only trainer. And that you can't work with. I mean, you're going to have a hard time, honestly. Okay, Tim, any tips on how to improve my dog with a drop command? Well, there's two different ways. I mean, one, you can... Um, you can do um, a trade out, right? You can trade one ball for another, one toy for another or whatever. Um, you can also disable the dog. A lot of times when I would teach a drop to a young puppy, I would have the dog on a harness. Here's one of the rare times I use a harness and I would lift up on the harness until the dog drops the item. Then I would get really excited, I would kick it, I'd let him go get it. I'd pick him up, out, drop it, let him go get it. It's a very, very fair way to do it. You don't wanna do it on a choke collar and choke the dog off. That would be abusive. <laughs> okay, a document about dog fighting. And I know why I know why you want that. I'm, you're not a dog fighter. I know that. I want to make sure everybody knows that. Um, you want me to talk about it. And I will at some point. Um, yeah. Um, how do I get my landlord, the owner of a Mal Shepherd mix, to understand the importance of a well-trained dog without hurting anyone's feelings? Um, maybe send him some videos. Go on, go on YouTube, you're here, and search some of the, um, you know, the FCI championships of IPO or Mondial Ring or something like that, and send him just a video. Say, God, look at this. Look how great these dogs can be trained. And let him see that, because that maybe will light a fire under his butt. I think it's a fantastic question. Um, okay, Keshwar, I, I just became a member on your site two weeks ago. That's not a question, but thank you for making it a statement, because I did look down and see it. Um, Okay, I can't pronounce your name, but I'll take your question anyway. Um, my 14-month-old female German Shepherd will just lie down and watch when strangers enter my property. She thinks all humans are friends. How do I teach her to alert me when strangers approach our home? You know, um, it's not something that I would try to do because you're going to need to make the strangers more suspicious. And... Um, I, would, I wouldn't do it, right? If, if the dog is really calm and everything, it's a really, really nice behavior. And it's the temperament, the drive of that dog. It's the personality of that dog. And if you start to change that personality, hey, 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 Maya, then um, you're going to put a behavior or drive into the dog that that dog might not be comfortable with. Um, let's see. Okay, here's one. Paige, I have a four-month-old Malinois, and she's a great dog and very intelligent. I've tried redirecting her energy, but she bites 24-7. What do you recommend doing to redirect biting if toys don't always work? So, Paige, it's a four-month-old Malinois. Four-month-old Malinois are going to uh, Malinois are going to bite until they're at least a year or so old. 
crating the dog, taking the dog out, good structure training, short training, ending it on a positive note, giving the dog something to bite on, not getting super wound up when the dog does bite you because it's just the natural, natural drive of this dog to do that. She's not being aggressive. Be, be really aware of that. Okay, I'm going to here and there have to scroll around to find, because this um, kind of gets screwed up. Okay, here's one here. Oh, okay, look at this. Uh, Dino. Dino Mob says, I've been very patient and thorough with training Training dog with toddler, always supervising crate gates around for three years. How do I start to integrate coexisting safely? Well, that's a great question, right? So if you've had been doing this for three years, you should already start to see behaviors. And the, I'm assuming the toddler is now three years old because you've had them together. Now, did you start this when the dog was a puppy? When the dog was, you know, what are you seeing in the dog? Are you seeing the dog to be calm? So the next phase I would do here with, you know, if you've done the baby gates and the crate and everything, now teach the dog, make sure the dog understands a good solid down command. If you, first of all, I'm going to preface this by saying, if you feel that the dog is going to put your child in danger, don't do any of this. If you have any indication that the dog will bite your child, don't do it, right? This, uh, what I'm about to tell you is if you have seen really, really good, good behaviors in the dog, what I would do is teach the dog a solid down command, down or place command, and then I would bring your child, you make sure somebody is there to handle the dog and the child. Um, what I always like to do is I always like to have the child or the other, like, like an older dog or a younger dog, in my arms, and the dog must know, you lie down there, I've got this, this precious commodity with me here. This is very important to me, this commodity. Um, I love it, and I will not tolerate you coming and doing anything bad. So I, good, good, good. I, I like, like with Ba, I'll give you a great example. Ba's a good boy, a whole boss, and then I would pet Maya, pet Maya, Maya lie down. Boom. If she showed any aggression, I would be able to protect this toddler or this this other creature um but make sure that the dog has it but a good solid place command let the dog in for a little bit then out keep it short but if you've done it for three years kudos to you that's just fantastic to hear that somebody actually did that um okay silver staker and again i'm also going through and not trying to get people who have if i've answered your question i may not get to a second one today it's just we just have a lot of God, we're almost out of time. I've got to end this in like one minute. So this may be the last one. Since I never trained it before, a dog before, I have an eight-week-old German Shepherd. He will get protection training at 15 months. Should I get someone to do the basic? Yes. Um, you need, first of all, if he's 15 months old, you should start. Protection training starts way before that. You need to get this dog in to start doing some rag work, start doing some basic structure building, some basic engagement training, some basic um, understanding of what the dog's doing. 15 months is too old to start a dog with protection training. Um, get to a good IPO club, a good Mondio club. I mean, if you've got a German Shepherd, you're going to go to an IGP club. Get a good IGP club with, with people who have solid balance training who are going to take your dog and and lay a solid foundation for protection do not do not wait till the dog is 15 months old it's just really 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 way too late and you're not going to do your dog any any favors um so i'm gonna i'm gonna end here because i gotta um i gotta get ready for my member if you're a member you can kind of sw uh, swap over um Thank you, Silver Staker. That was very nice. Another $9 sticker. I don't know what a sticker means, but it's, it's, I'm going to just add it to the broadcast and see what it does. Um, thank you guys for being here. Thank you for your questions. Um, and thank you for putting up with me when I get really pissed off at people, because I do. You know, if, if somebody's going to... I don't mind if somebody challenges me. I've, I've had that my whole life. I had that when I had my karate school and everything. Um, I, you know, I would really recommend you guys to consider joining my, my membership section at robertcabral.com. It's, it's, a, it's a bargain. I mean, there's... 85 plus lessons there's you know 1800 minutes of video instruction there's two uh questions and answer podcasts every week it's the best money that you'll spend for training your dog it's you know i think it's like 50 cents a day or something i, I don't even know what it ad adds up to but um it's the best thing you're going to do for your dog subscribe to this channel when you when you go out of the here make sure you hit the thumbs up button hit the bell to subscribe like this channel follow this channel there's new videos coming every week i put up a new video and i try to do a live one as well um be sure you um like I said, check out my podcast on uh, Apple, on Google. It's now on Amazon as well. It's everywhere. Thank you guys so much for being here. I love you guys. Um, I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate your support. I appreciate what you're doing to train your dogs. Um, 
If you're interested in any of my merchandise, my shirts, um, they're available here on YouTube as well. I will be doing another live soon. I guess this So You Got a Malinois thing is a really good topic. Maybe we, we'll do it more often. Um, I really enjoy talking about working dogs. I love dogs, and uh, I love sharing my knowledge with you guys to make your life with your dog better. I'll see you next week. Take care.